for 2016. It's wonderful to be here uh, this morning to do this with our wonderful students here who are going to who are going to uh, recite the poetry for us and compete for a place in the uh, Vermont Poetry Out Loud in a few weeks, which Mr. Brown will explain in a few moments. So we're happy to be here to be a part of this whole celebration today. We're going to begin then with a prayer and a welcome and an announcement, and then I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Brown. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God our Father, we thank you for the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of our school, for the great things that we do here, for the great ways in which we help each other to grow and to find our full potential to know who we are and to what we're called. Lord, it is your gift that has brought us to this place today. Bless our reciters as they step up to this podium to do their, to do their part. And bless us all, Lord, in this journey of life and of faith. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My only announcement before I hand this off is uh, to remind you that, you know, this is, this is live. You're not, watching, uh, you're not watching a television. This is not stunt night rehearsal uh, or anything like that. So I really don't want you, you know, yelling out, Go Joey, go Joey, or anything like that. All right? You see how foolish I looked when I did that? Well, there you have it. Okay, so I'd like to welcome. I'd like to welcome Mr. Brown to the podium here. Why don't we thank Mr. Brown for what he's doing for us with this poetry? Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you, and thank you, folks, for standing up here to, to do this. I just need a moment to savor this. This is amazing. It's one of the high points of, of my year. Certainly, it's certainly one of the high points of the school. You know, I, just to step out for a second and take, take a moment, I have the privilege every every year, usually two or three times a year, to travel around the country and I, I get to work with teachers, with schools, with districts, some of them really, really small, tiny little places in the backwoods of West Virginia, sometimes pretty big public school districts in Chicago, in Boston. We always end up talking at some point about poetry out loud as a piece of how we do poetry at, at, at my school. And many of them are also involved in the program because this is a nationwide, a nationwide program. It's sponsored by the Poetry Foundation and the Vermont Council on the Arts and the English Department of Rights and a number of corporate sponsors who also think that this is a great idea. But they ask me, people ask me, how many people do poetry out loud at your school? And I tell them, all of them. And that invariably gets, whoa, or something like that. What's really amazing about today is that all of you have done what these folks are going to do for you today. You've all been there. You've all done it in your English classes. And some of you have had struggles, and some of you have had triumphs. And at the end of the day, you've all been there, and you know what it feels like. You know what success feels like, you know what it looks like, and, and I know that you're going to appreciate this for the last several years, ever, since we started doing this. We have this assembly every year, and, and it never ceases to amaze me that we can put 400 young people in a gym on bleachers and recite poetry at them, and they sit there quietly, respectfully, and in loving support of their classmates who were up here giving their all to their poets and to you. It, it's inspiring to me, and I hope it will be inspiring to you. 
In between recitations, I'm going to be filling a little bit while our judges, Mr. Matarazzo, Ms. McGorry Plaza, Mr. Hayes, Mrs. Miller, tabulate, or, or they rather they, they enter scores, as was done in your classes. And they will be, those scores will be tabulated ably, representing the uh, accounting firm Price Waterhouse, Mr. Paul DeFalco, who's helped me. Very much appreciate. So let's get to the poetry. Let's get to the good stuff. Some of the poets that you're going to be hearing today, I I've heard a lot, I've read a lot, and in some cases I know I've had a chance to meet them, which is a real thrill. You know, you get the backstage pass. But even in the poetry reading, there's such things. And others, such as this first person, I, I know nothing about. Uh, the poet is W.D., that's as in William Daniel Earhart. And all I know about him is that his publicity picture looks like he ought to have been on, in the movie, Anchorman. He is a Vietnam-era writer, Vietnam-era veteran, and a writer of poetry. And to represent to you, will you welcome Sam Dickens? Beautiful Wreckage by W.D. Earhart. What if I didn't shoot the old lady running away from our patrol, or the old man in the back of the head, or the boy in the marketplace? Or what if the boy, but he didn't have a grenade? And the woman in hue didn't lie in the rain in a mortar pit with seven marines just for food. Gaffney didn't get hit in the knee. Ames didn't die in the river. Ski didn't die in a medevac chopper between Contien and Da Ne. In Vietnamese, Contien means place of angels. What if it really was? Instead of a place of rotting sandbags, incoming heavy artillery, rats, and mud. What if the angels were Ames and Ski? Or the lady, the man, and the boy? And they lifted Gaffney out of the mud and healed his shattered knee. What if none of it happened the way I said? Would it all be a lie? Would the wreckage be suddenly beautiful? Would the dead rise up and walk? Over 5,000 high school students in Vermont have done poetry out loud this year. That's a little factoid I got from the uh, Vermont Arts Council. And where this is going uh, is, is part of a statewide competition about which I will tell you more as, as the morning goes on. The next step, at the end of the assembly today, hopefully if the, the numbers can be tabulated quickly, we could crown our Rice champion. Who will go on to further levels of competition? More of which I will be telling you shortly. Mrs. Miller, are we ready to move forward? You need to give me that up on the thumbometer. Remember that? The thumbometer. I have a good thumbometer reading. Our, our, our next poet, Patty Ann Rogers. She's another one that I don't know anything about but would like to, if only because she's a teacher of kindergarten, of university, and of high school students. So uh, beyond the fact that, that she's from the South and, and has been a teacher, Patty Ann Rogers, represented today with, by Maura Thompson. The Existence of the Soul by Patty Ann Rogers. How confident I am it is there. And don't I bring it? As if it were enclosed in a fine leather case to particular places solely for its own sake. Haven't I set it down before the variegated canyon and the undeviating bald self dome? 
Don't I feed it on ivory calcium and ruffled shell bellies and shore boulders? On the sight of the petrol motionless over the sea, its laid feet hanging. Don't I make sure it apprehends the invisibly fine spray more than once? I have seen that it takes in every detail it can manage concerning the garden wall and its borders. I have listed for it the comings and goings of 100 species of insects explicitly described. I, I have named the chartreuse stripe, and the fimbriated and antenna, and the bulbed thorax, and the multiple eye. I have sketched the brilliant wings of the trumpet vine and invented new vocabularies describing the interchanges between rocks and the crevices, between the holly lip and the concept of itself. And if not for its sake, why would I go out into the night alone and stare deliberately straight up into 15 billion years ago and more? I have cherished it. I have named it. By my own solicitations, I have proof of its presence. As I was saying, the, the next step is, is further levels of competition. The next uh, is, is in Barry, and it's on the 11th of March. And at the Barry competition, students from all over the state, each school champion, uh, recites not one, but two poems. And things get a little bit more serious. And from that, they'll select, uh, I, I forget the number, but I think it's about 20 students who will represent their schools and their regions in the state competition. That's going to be on March 17th at uh, the studios of Vermont Public Television. And that hopefully will have a representative at that state final competition. It will be in the evening and you all are invited to come and support our champion. It's a big deal, it's a big event, and it's a big studio, and it's usually packed with people. I see the thumb on there, we can move on. Our next reading is, is by a poet you may not know too much about. Her. She has, has a long name, and I'm, I'm going to hopefully get it all right. Frances Ellen Watkins. Harper. She's a 19th century poet. She's an African-American poet. Uh, my students right now in, in the 10th grade were reading Frederick Douglass. Uh, she is part of that stream, that, that stream of voices emanating from the 19th century. A very powerful and inspiring writer. She will be represented by Dina John. Let the Light Enter by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Light, more light. The shadows deepen and my life is ebbing low. Throw the windows widely open. Light, more light before I go. Softly let the balmy sunshine play around my dying bed. Ere the dimly lighted valley, I with lonely feet must tread. Light, more light, for death is weaving shadows round my waiting sight. And I fain would gaze upon him through a stream of earthly light. Not for greater gifts of genius, not for thoughts more grandly bright. All the dying poet whispers is a prayer for light, 
more light. He not the gathered laurels vanishing slowly from his sight. All the poet's aspirations center in that prayer for light. Gracious Savior, when life's daydreams melt and vanish from the sight, may our dim and longing vision then be blessed with light, more light. Readings or recitations like these give truth to the observation that, that it comes from Robert Frost, but that poetry is what you get when an emotion finds its thought and that thought finds words. It's kind of reaching down deep into the bottom, darkest, deepest level of your consciousness and finding a way to let that out into the world. Our next writer, uh, kind of an interesting guy in a way, he's, uh, he's definitely Midwestern. He was born in Iowa, where they had a, some kind of a celebration earlier this week. But uh, he has moved to Nebraska, and the poem that you will hear tells you all about it a former poet laureate of the United States. His name is Ted Kuser, and he will be represented by Beatrice Schlansky. So this is Nebraska by Ted Kuser. The gravel road rides with a slow gallop over the fields. The telephone lines streaming behind, its billow of dust full of the sparks of red-winged blackbirds. On either side, those dear old ladies, the loosening bars, their little windows dulled by cataracts of hay and cobwebs, hide broken tractors under their skirts. So this is Nebraska, a Sunday afternoon, July, driving along with your hand out, squeezing the air, a meadowlark waiting on every post. Behind a sheltered belt of cedars, top deep in hollyhocks, pollen, and bees, a pickup kicks its fenders off and settles back to read the clouds. You feel like that. You feel like letting your tires go flat, like letting the mice fill a nest in your muffler, like being no more than the truck in the weeds, clucking with chickens or sticky with honey, or holding a skinny old man in your lap while he watches the road, waiting for someone to wave to. You feel like waving. You feel like stopping the car and dancing around in the room. You wave instead and leave your hand out, gliding, larkling, over the leaf, over the houses. I don't believe it. I was just asked a math question. What is the world coming to? As we do our, our recitations, you have done them this year. I do them from time to time, and these folks, of course, prepared them. Part of reciting a poem requires making some kind of a relationship with that writer. And whether you know it or not, the person whose words you memorized last fall, most of you, they're going to stick with you. And, and like it or not, you, you formed some kind of relationship that will be a lifelong one. Sometimes the relationships go more than that, and, and I, I need, just for my own self, to acknowledge the relationship to the next poet we'll be hearing. Um, it's a sentimental one. He was a classmate of my dad's back in 1942. 
And you can imagine, you know, he, he's still alive. He's 94 years old, I think, and, and, and he still remembers, which I think is kind of neat. My dad's long gone, but uh, this guy still remembers his, his friend and, and uh, not roommate, but down the hall. Oh, it's Richard Wilbur, distinguished voice in American letters, and, and for very personal reasons, a, a personal thing, is represented by Owen Quest. Sit in a theater, 
see it play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra breathes fitful the music of the spheres. Mimes, in the form of God on high, mutter and mumble low and hither and thither fly, mere puppets, they who come and go at bidding of vast, formless things that shift the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings invisible woe. That motley drama. Oh, be sure it shall not be forgot, with its phantom chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not, through a circle that ever returneth in to the self-same spot. And much of madness, and more of sin, and horror, the soul, the plot. But see, amid the mimic rout, a crawling shape intrude, a blood-red thing that rides from out the scenic solitude. It rides, it rides with mortal pains, the lines become its food. And seraph sob at vermin veins in human gore reviewed. Out, out are the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral ball, comes down with the rush of a storm while the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy man and its hero the conqueror worm. We've talked a little bit about the state competition that it goes to uh, the finals on March 17th at uh, Vermont PBS Studios. The Vermont winner gets to go on, gets an all-expense paid trip to D.C. where they get to compete with 53 other students, that's the 50 states and various territories, in a national final for Poetry Out Loud, and then it gets kind of serious. That's when the prizes involved run to five figures, and uh, there's some serious hardware to go with that, too. So, we like to think that the journey starts here. Why not? Why not? Our, our next poet is, is another one of whom I do not know too much, except that his name is one that does you, you don't miss in any discussion of contemporary Southern American poets. They have their own kind of cluster, their own kind of group. And, and nobody speaks of this guy, uh, or I should say speaks of this group, without including uh, this, this next poet. For all of his southern credentials, he has spent some time in the Northeast. He's a graduate of Williams College down in, in Western Massachusetts. So, you know, you, you can have your grits, but uh, you have to remember you've been up here in Bacon Sierra Country, too. Our next recitation recitation of the works of Tony Hoagland, Abby Jones. Personal, by Tony Hoagland. Don't take it personal, he said, but I did. I took it all quite personal. The breeze and the river and the color of the fields, the price of grapefruit and stamps, the wet hair of women in the rain. The government reminded me of my father. 
with its deafness and its loss. And the weather reminded me of my mom with her tropical squalls. Enjoy it while you can, instead of happiness. Think first, they said of talk. Get over it, they said, at the school of broken hearts. But I couldn't, and I didn't, and I don't believe in the clean break. I believe in the compound fracture served in the sauce of dirty regret. I believe in saying it all, and taking it all back, and saying it again for good measure while the air fills up with I'm sorry's. Like wheeling birds and the trees look seasick in the wind. Oh, life, can you blame me for making a scene? You were that yellow caboose, the moon disappearing over a ridge of cloud. And I was the dog, chained some fool's backyard, barking and barking, trying to convince everything else to take it personal too. We move on with, with this is a, a strange category and, and it's only one that works for me, but category called Poets whose graves I've been to, and, and it's a small group. Relax, uh, but they, they're, they're they're enough to make a group. And this one's kind of neat because his tomb is in London. It's in this huge church, St. Paul's Cathedral, where at one point he was the dean, the, the chief priest of St. Paul's Church. And, and his memorial, it's a riveting statue. Here he is, he's standing up, but he's wrapped in his burial shroud. He posed for this sculpture, wrapped in his own shroud. As if to say, here I am, I know what it is to be alive, and I know what awaits me. There are two John Dunn's. There's John Dunn the Younger, who is a kind of wild and crazy guy, and there is a deep, meditative, inspiring John Dunn. A, a preacher of the 1600s, um, magnificent poet, and, and still read and studied today. And I leave it to you to decide which John Dunn, uh, which side of this guy's personality you'll be hearing in our next recitation by Jack Lyons. Hymn to God, My God, In My Sickness by John Dunn. Since I am coming to that holy room where with thy choir of saints forevermore I shall be made thy music as I come, I tune the instrument here at the door, and what I must do then, think here before. Whilst my physicians by their love are grown cosmographers, and I their map who lie flat on this bed, that by them may be shown that this is my southwest discovery, per freightum fabris, by these straits to die. I joy that in these straits I see my west, for, though their currents yield return to none, what shall my west hurt me? As west and east in all flat maps, and I am one, are one, so death doth touch the resurrection. Is the Pacific Sea my home, or are the eastern riches? Is Jerusalem, Amnion, and Magellan and Gibraltar, all straits and none but straits are ways to them, whether where Japheth dwelt or Cham or Shem. We think that Paradise and Calvary, 
Christ's cross and Adam's tree stood in one place. Look, Lord, and find both Adams met in me. As the first Adam's sweat surrounds my face, may the last Adam's blood in my soul embrace. So in his purple rat, receive me, Lord. By these his thorns, give me his other crown. And as to other souls I preach thy word, be this my text, my sermon to mine own. Therefore, that he may raise the Lord from his death. I get asked sometimes, so who do you think is the greatest living poet? And I, I usually run from that question. Uh, there is no way you can get it right because history is waiting, you know, to count coup on you. But if I had to at least make a list of possible candidates, this next poet would have to go on there. I've heard him read, and and it's it's quite a trip. Um, he is someone who can take you from uh, sort of whimsical to deadly serious in a heartbeat. And, and he has been called by some uh, kind of the best of the current crop. It, it's going to be for your grandchildren to decide when they're old and gray, who was the greatest poet of the early 21st century. I, I'm not going there. But I'd be willing to bet that at least some consideration is given to the American poet Paul Muldoon who will be represented for us in a recitation by Ford Healy. Ford. Hedgehog by Paul Muldoon. The snail moves like a hovercraft held up by a rubber cushion of itself, sharing its secret with the hedgehog. The hedgehog shares its secret with no one. We say, hedgehog, come out of yourself and we will love you. We only want to hear what you have to say. We want your answers to our questions. The hedgehog gives nothing away, keeping itself to itself. We wonder what a hedgehog has to hide, why it so distrusts. We forget the god under this crown of thorns. We forget that never again will a god trust in the world. in the gym, and, and I, you, in the gym, you can never be too far away in your mind from the clock, and I, I'm mindful of the fact that you've been sitting on hard bleachers for about 45 minutes, and nobody has yet sunk a basket. Uh, this is pretty amazing right there. Uh, I, I, I do know, no, not now, but I, I do know that, that bleachers can, can be kind of tough. I'd like to suggest that we stand up and stretch for a couple of minutes, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll get back to work. <laughs> oh my, this is, uh, this is terrific. Kind of tough, tough to bring it back, but let us bring it back into focus. This is serious stuff. Our, our judges have been working uh, very hard. I, one of the best parts of, of my job is that I don't have to fill out ballots. Uh, making judgments on these readings and these recitations is a tough job. And uh, we thank Mr. Matarazzo, Mrs. Rory Plaza, Mr. Hay, Mrs. Miller, Mr. DeFalco and his calculator for, for taking care of this and doing a marvelous job at it. Our, our next reading, our next recitation, comes from a, a poem by Linda Pestan. She's living proof that it's never too late to become a poet. She, she began publishing at the age of 39, having developed a passion for writing and then putting it aside. Putting it aside so she could raise a family, do all of the things that, that she needed to do as, as a, a mother, as a wife. And then at 39 saying, you know, I'm going back picking up that, that, that poetry again and she has become one of America's great poetic voices. To give us a poem of hers, here is Belize Abani. The 
Invitation to be Happy by Linda Paston. It is more onerous than the rights of beauty or have one. Harder than love. But you expected of me casually. The way you expect the sun to come up, not in spite of rain or clouds, but because of them. And so, I smile, as if my own fidelity to sadness were a hidden vice. That downward tongue on my mouth, my old suspicion that health and love are brief irrelevancies. No more than lather in the warm dark, strangle let down. Happiness. I try to hoist it on my narrow shoulders again. A knapsack heavy with gold coins. I stumble around the house, bump into things only Midas himself would understand. We, we don't always think of, of poets as, as popular figures, as uh, people who can, who can electrify a nation, and, and yet they are. The, the next writer whose work we'll hear was remarkably popular in her own day, though nowadays we would not necessarily pick up the name. It's not a household word necessarily, but, but she was in the early 1800s. She wrote, people read, remembered, and kind of hung on to her words. And in 1862, she wrote a poem that appeared in the Atlantic magazine that's gone through several ownership changes, but is still in publication. Atlantic published a poem that caught the spirit of the northern part of the nation, was quickly set to music, and became one of the great anthems of the North in the Civil War. You'll recognize the lyric. It began as a poem by our next poet, Julia Ward Howe, whose poem will be recited and read by Zach McCormick. Yes! Battled in the Republic by Julie Ward Howe. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage with the grapes of Rather's door. He hath loosed the fatal lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built him an altar in the evening, use and dance. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I have read a fiery gospel, rich in burnished rows of steel. As you do with my contemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero, born of woman, press the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. O oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him, be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Well, God is marching on. Hello, the lineup of, of today's recitations is largely random uh, coincidences spoken, and we have another northern voice, Civil War era, though definitely a voice in a different key. Again, my students who've 
whether American Lit with me are, are going to say, oh, yes, this is the guy whose uh, poetry sounds like a shopping list who, who doesn't rhyme for, for anything. Um, the great ego, if you will, the one who says, I, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume. Modest American poet that he was, he sounded a barbaric yawp across the rooftops of the world. Walt Whitman, a selection from Whitman recited by Meg Collins. Section 35 from Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. Would you hear of an old time sea fight? Would you learn who won by the light of the moon and stars? List to the yarn as my grandmother's father, the sailor, told it to me. Our foe was no skulk in his ship, I tell you, said he. His was the surly English pluck, and there is no tougher or truer, and never was, and never will be. Along the lower eve he came, horribly raking us. We closed with him, the yards entangled, the cannon touched, my captain lashed fast with his own hands. We had received some eighteen-pound shots under the water, on our lower gun deck, two large pieces had burst at the first fire, killing all around and blowing up overhead. Fighting at sundown, fighting at dark, ten o'clock at night, the full moon well up, our leaks on the gain, and five feet of water reported. The master at arms, Loosing the prisoners confined in the afterhold to give them a chance for themselves. The transit to and from the magazine is now stopped by the sentinels. They see so many strange faces, they do not know whom to trust. Our frigate takes fire. The other asks if we demand quarter. If our colors are struck and the fighting done, now I laugh content, for I hear the voice of my little captain. We have not struck, he composedly cries. We have just begun our part of the fighting. Only three guns are in use. One is directed by the captain himself against the enemy's mainmast. Two well served with grape and canister, silence his musketry and clear his decks. The tops alone second the fire of this little battery, especially the main top. They hold out bravely during the whole of the action. Not a moment cease, the leaks gain fast on the pumps, the fire eats toward the powder magazine. One of the pumps has been shot away. It is generally thought we are sinking. Serene stands the little captain. He is not hurried. His voice is neither high nor low. His eyes give more light to us than our battle lanterns. Towards twelve, there in the beams of the moon, they surrender to us. The next poet whose work we're going to hear is something of a rare phenomenon. He is a best-selling poet. He's a poet whose work is, is in demand by booksellers. They can't keep enough of them on their shelves. And if you find your way to the poetry section of a large bookstore, 
you're, you're going to find, you know, one of these and two of those and maybe, maybe, maybe a copy of that and you're going to find about three feet of books by Billy Collins, who, again, is one of these folks who at one time or other becomes everybody's favorite poet and has a way of sticking around for a while. His poems have a way of taking you out far and, and then surprisingly coming back. Um, kind of hard to describe, but he has, he has a puckish wit and a depth of vision that take you by surprise at every turn. To recite a poem by Billy Collins is Tracy Ferguson. The Death of Allegory by Billy Collins. I'm wondering what became of all those tall abstractions that used to pose, robed and statuesque, in paintings, and parade about on the pages of the Renaissance, displaying their capital letters like license plates. Truth, cantering on a powerful horse. Chastity, eyes downcast, fluttering with veils. Each one was marble come to life, a thought in a coat. Courtesy, bowing, with one hand always extended. Villainy, sharpening an instrument behind a wall. Reason with her crown, and constancy alert behind a helm. They are all retired now, consigned to a Florida for tropes. Justice is there, standing by an open refrigerator. Valor lies in bed, listening to the rain. Even death has nothing to do but mend his cloak and hood, and all their props are locked away in a warehouse, our glasses, gloves, blindfolds, and shackles. Even if you called them back, there are no places left for them to go, no garden of mirth or bower of bliss. The valley of forgiveness is lined with condominiums, and chainsaws are howling in the forest of despair. Here, on the table, near the window, is a vase of peonies, and next to it, black binoculars and a money clip. Exactly the kind of thing we now prefer, objects that sit quietly on a line in lower case, themselves and nothing more, a wheelbarrow, an empty mailbox, a razor blade resting in a glass ashtray. As for the others, the great ideas on horseback, and the long-haired virtues in embroidered gowns, it looks as though they have traveled down that road you see on the final page of storybooks. The one that winds up a green hillside and disappears into an unseen valley where everyone must be fast asleep. I'll just, just say in, in, in passing, uh, I got to see Billy Collins read one time who was at the annual AP English reading. And if you can visualize this, you've got 3,000 English teachers, scary in itself, <laughs> packed into a giant auditorium and there, you know, way, way at the far end of the, the place, a tiny little speck from where I was sitting in the cheap seats. There's Billy Collins and, and he had this audience just absolutely in the palm of his hand. He is a terrific public reader of, of his own work. Did I fail to mention that I still don't know much of anything about Patty Ann Rogers? I meant, mentioned that earlier in the morning, and, and I still don't know anything about Patty Ann Rogers, except to say that she's a teacher, and she's from Joplin, Missouri, and, and that's about it. I also know that she's next. And in... Uh, a fairly lame introduction to Patty Ann Rogers. Uh, let's give you another introduction through Marissa Sylvester. On the Existence of the Soul by Patty Ann Rogers. How confident I am it is there. Don't I bring it? as if it were enclosed in a fine leather case, to particular places, solely for its own sake? Haven't I set it down before the variegated canyon, 
and the undeviating bald salt dome? Don't I feed it on ivory calcium and ruffled shell bellies, shore boulders, on the site of the petrel motionless over the sea, its splayed feet hanging? Don't I make sure it apprehends the invisibly fine spray more than once? I have seen that it takes in every detail I can manage concerning the garden wall and its borders. I have listed for it the comings and goings of 100 species of insects explicitly described. I have named the chartreuse stripe and the fimbriated antenna, the bulb thorax and the multiple eye. I have sketched the brilliant wings of the trumpet vine and invented new vocabularies, describing the interchanges between rocks and their crevices, between the hauling lip and its concept of itself. And if not for its sake, why would I go out into the night alone and stare deliberately straight up into 15 billion years ago and more? I have cherished it. I have named it. By my own solicitations, I have proof of its presence. Our next recitation is uh, coming from the pen of, of kind of an interesting international character. Who, he, he is an American poet. He writes in English, but he and his family immigrated from Indonesia where they had fled to where they had fled from China. His, his father, this is a little piece of poetic trivia for you. His father was a personal physician of, of Chairman Mao Zedong. And, and the family fell out of favor politically and, and fled to Indonesia and then came to the US. And, and the son became a distinguished American poet who draws deeply on his roots, who, whose work has a way of kind of sweeping you from physical reality into a dreamland in, in a second. Uh, our next recitation is from the work of Lee Young Lee, as by Olivia Parker. Falling, the code, by Lee Young Lee. Through the night, I listen to the sound of apples dropping in the yard. Each dull thud of unseen apple falling to earth once and forever, over and over. <laughs> on. The next poet is, is Elizabeth Bishop, and she's kind of an acquired taste. She is a 20th century American poet. She, she was a tortured soul in many ways. She had uh, a lot of very deep emotional difficulties, and as a result, uh, I think she understood uh, from personal experience some of the, some of the complexities of, of being in, in, in this world. She was uh, a feminist before it was cool to be a feminist. She was associated with a number of, of major American writers in, in, in their own right, and, and she was part of a cluster of people who uh, kind of boiled out of eastern Massachusetts. And she was particularly tight with the poet Robert Lowell, with whom she was romantically involved for a while. And she was also kind of a protege of another major American poet, Marianne Moore. And she's going to be represented by another Marianne, Marianne Poland. Feeling sick. 
attestation by Elizabeth Bishop. Oh, but it is dirty, this little filling station. Oil soaked, oil permeated to a disturbing overall black translucency. Be careful with that match. Father wears a dirty, oil soaked monkey suit that cuts him under the arms, and several quick and saucy and greasy sons assist him. It's a family filling station, all quite thoroughly dirty. Do they live in the station? It has a cement porch behind the pumps, and on it, a set of crushed and grease impregnated wicker work. On the wicker sofa, a dirty dog, quite comfy. Some comic books provide the only note of color, of certain color. They lie upon a big, dim doily drinking a tabaret, part of the set, beside a big hirsute begonia. Why the extraneous plant? Why the tabaret? Why, oh, why the doily? Embroidered in daisy stitch with marguerites, I think, and heavy with gray crochet. Somebody embroidered the doily. Somebody waters the plant, or oils it, maybe. Somebody arranges the rows of cans so that they softly say, a so, 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 to high-strung automobiles. Somebody loves us all. It's hard to imagine poets as rock stars, but over the years they have been. Uh, just as perhaps people might point out driving through Burlington, oh yeah, this is where, where, where Calvin Coolidge's wife grew up, or, or perhaps in the future they'll say, oh, there's the Hannafords where Bernie Sanders used to shop. Uh, it happened, yeah. Or you know, here's the school where your bourgeois used to teach. There's some, some landmarking things. People used to tip the cab drivers, that's the carriage cabs, this is the 19th century, but they, they would tip the carriage drivers to take them past Longfellow's house on the chance that someone might catch a glimpse of the great man kind of strolling out onto the front lawn or, or looking at his newspaper on the front porch or something like that. He was, in, in so many ways, a celebrity in his own time. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around the fact that you know this kind of celebrity uh, attached to someone who wrote poetry and, and you know, was not an athlete or, or a fashion model or something like that. But Longfellow, in his day, was kind of America's great rock star. And, and perhaps you'll get a hint of where that comes from in a recitation from Longfellow by Sarah Sim. The Children's Hour by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as the children's hour. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened, and voices soft and sweet. From my study I see in the lamplight descending the broad hall stair, great Alice and laughing Allegra, and Edith with golden hair. A whisper, and then a silence. Yet I know by their merry eyes they are plotting and planning together to take me by surprise. A sudden rush from the stairway, a sudden raid from the hall. By three doors left unguarded, they enter my castle wall. They climb up into my turret, or the arm and back of my chair. If I try to escape, they surround me. They seem to be everywhere. They almost devour me with kisses. Their arms about me entwine. Till I think of the Bishop of Bingen in his mouse tower on the Rhine. 
Do you think, O oh blue-eyed banditti, because you have scaled the wall, such an old mustache as I am is not a match for you all? I have you fast in my fortress and will not let you depart, but put you down into the dungeon in the round tower of my heart. And there I will keep you forever, yes, forever, and a day, till the walls shall crumble to ruin and molder in dust away. Next we hear from, from a poet whom I, I can only think of as a kind of cankered muse, uh, in some ways tormented by being born at the wrong time in the wrong place, a great intellect in her own right, a terrific critic in her own right. She was a member of this elite circle of writers and thinkers called the Algonquin Club. And she was a woman at a time when women had no place at that table and writes with a kind of bitterness one of her shorter poems which i can recite here because it's only two lines long she said men seldom make passes at girls who wear glasses it had nothing to do with visual acuity and everything to do with the fact that she was an intellectual at a time when it was considered more fashionable to be pretty. And, and sort of caught in that moment uh, was Dorothy Parker, who will be recited for you by Maggie Fitzgerald. Love Song by Dorothy Parker. My own dear love, he is strong and bold, and he cares not what comes after. His words ring sweet as a chime of gold, and his eyes are lit with laughter. He is jubilant as a flag unfurled. Oh, a girl, she'd not forget him. My own dear love, he is all my world, and I wish I'd never met him. My love, he's mad, and my love, he's fleet, and a wild young wood thing bore him. The ways are fair to his roaming feet, and the skies are sunlit for him. As sharply sweet to my heart he seems as the fragrance of acacia. My own dear love, he is all my dreams, and I wish he were in Asia. <laughs> my love runs by like a day in June, and he makes no friends of sorrows. He'll tread his galloping rigadoon in the pathway of the morrows. He'll live his days where the sunbeams start, nor could storm or wind uproot him. My own dear love, he is all my heart, and I wish somebody'd shoot him. <laughs> See what I mean about Dorothy Parker. If you've been counting and, and, and watching closely, you will notice that we have come to the end of our recitations. Let's applaud our It's tough. And you guys have been wonderful, so let's have a round of applause for you guys as well. In just a few moments, as the, the tallies are being made, we're going to be able to, I think, they're not telling me anything here. This is, this is <laughs> five faces of stone looking at me. I don't know what's going on. They're, they're, we're hoping that we'll have a tally. We'll be able to crown our, our race champion and a first and second runner up. But as, as we come to a conclusion, first, um, my own thanks here. Hang with it for a second. This is hard to do. First of all, my own thanks for this, and, and, and let's return maybe to the words of a, the first poet laureate of the state of Vermont, one whose 
uh, writings have been uh, certainly read a lot in the school, Robert Frost. And he said that, that a poem begins in delight and, and ends in wisdom. In, in clarifying life, maybe, um, we come away with the pleasure as well. Our thanks to our judges who have done their work, and now it's in the hands of the tabulators. Thank you very much. I have to thank also my colleagues who have given up teaching time, which, which they tend to guard pretty jealously, we all do, and, and their willingness to go along with this and, and have this assembly is a tremendous vote of confidence. And again, I appreciate that. All right, here it is. <laughs> They're showing me point totals that will go with me in my grave. <laughs> Our second runner up, Sarah Sam. Our first runner-up, Tracy Ferguson. And representing Rice in the next round of statewide competition, our 2016 champion, Maggie Fitzgerald. My first request is that my second period class kind of hang back and head back when I do. So if my second period class will head back when I do. You should all return, however, to your first period class to pick up your stuff and move on. Thank you very much.